Hey, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Ravi Fasano. I am a physicist at Inflection. Uh, and I, I also manage our, our clocks portfolio from a technical perspective. So at Inflection, we are developing new types of atomic clocks that are based on optical transitions, which can lead to significantly better performance than current state-of-the-art microwave clocks. Um, this talk is not really intended to be a, an advertisement for our tech. It's actually gonna be more of a celebration of the, the various research efforts that have led here from our, our counterparts in academia over the last 20 years. But if you want to see some of our technology, we currently have a clock running over at the Experience Center. So we've heard a lot this morning about different timing requirements for data centers. Um, maybe the most obvious kind of canonical example here is guaranteeing external consistency in databases. So when we have a database that can be accessed from you know, many different places at once, we need some way to time order these transactions to make sure that you know, I can't generate infinite money from trying to withdraw from my bank account sufficiently quickly. For next generation uh, optically switched networks, we're gonna need very precise clocks to limit jitter for clock and data recovery in optical transceivers. And then in jobs like uh, distributed ML training, high performance computing, it can be very important to have very, very precise time stamping, job scheduling, things like this. And to be able to basically unwind time in the event of an error and be able to surgically remove that error before it propagates through and corrupts the entire model. So of course the state of the art is the OCP time card, which is a NIC that you know, we all know very well. It delivers microsecond holdover by using some kind of onboard microwave clock, like a, a microchip Mac or a, a Safran MRO50. And it enables uh, PTP-based synchronization at the sub-microsecond level. So this really is phenomenal when you think about you know, the fact that many data centers are still using NTP. They're relying on network time protocol for millisecond level synchronization. What this enables is really, really a new frontier of timing performance, and it's already led to demonstrated improvements in database throughput. But what I want to talk about today is actually the next frontier in timing performance, which is enabled by optical clock technology. So an optical clock is an atomic clock that's based on an optical transition that ticks at a rate of hundreds of terahertz as opposed to, say, 9 gigahertz for a microwave clock. So what this means is that it divides time into smaller and smaller intervals, and therefore, it can make measurements substantially more precisely than a microwave clock can. And we have an additional advantage that any environmental perturbations to the clock transition frequency, things like electric fields, magnetic fields, vibration, temperature fluctuations, these are all effectively smaller, fractionally, due to the very, very high optical frequency. So what this means is that uh, in, in Contrast to the very high amount of engineering that's required to make a ruggedized microwave clock, optical clocks can be commercialized in significantly simpler form factors with much less environmental isolation and can outperform their microwave counterparts by orders of magnitude and performance. So you can see on this graph on the, the right that these are really a disruptive technology. We've seen steady progress with microwave clocks through the years but much faster progress with the optical clocks that was spurred in large part by development of the optical frequency comb, which is basically the optical clockwork that allows us to down convert optical signals to RF. Optical clocks reached parity with microwave clocks sometime around the year 2005 and have been continuing to make progress in the most recent years to the point where the absolute state of the art in you know, very large laboratory scale low TRL devices is 18 digits of Accuracy, 18 digits of statistical uncertainty, or 16 at just a second of averaging. And in layman's terms, of course, rigorous clock people can poke holes in this statement, but the, uh, the, the very hypey statement is that these clocks can gain or lose one second over the entire age of the universe. So at this level of performance, it starts to become a little bit weird to even think about clocks as timekeepers, right? They, they enable all kinds of really cool new applications in fundamental physics, searches for dark matter, tests of general relativity, things like relativistic geodesy and chronometric leveling where you can actually make centimeter level height measurements through time by itself. But I think that they're also gonna enable some really cool new applications in data centers, which I'm gonna talk about in the coming slides. But first we're gonna take a little bit of a look into what an optical clock looks like and how it differs from a microwave clock. So like a microwave clock, or like really any existing clock, we have some kind of local oscillator, which instead of a quartz crystal, in our case, is a laser. And the frequency of this laser is scanned, 
until we observe an interaction with atoms which are stored in some kind of thermal vapor or ultra-cold gas, in our case, a vapor. So when we tune the laser frequency onto resonance with the atomic transition, we see atoms being promoted from a ground state to a clock state and then cascading back down to the ground state, emitting photons which we can capture as fluorescence that tell us that we are exactly on resonance. This allows us to generate a fluorescence signal and then by modulating the laser, we can create an error signal which is basically an anti-symmetric signal around the center of the detuning so that with a PID scheme or a similar controller, we can stabilize the frequency of the laser with extreme precision. So what this gives us is a signal at hundreds of terahertz that is exceptionally stable compared to any kind of RF or microwave signal. But you know we can't just interface that trivially with electronics. The time card doesn't have a uh, you know 193 terahertz optical input on the front panel. So we need another device called a frequency comb to down convert that to usable frequencies. A frequency comb is basically an ultra fast pulsed laser where if you look in the frequency domain, you see that the spectrum is comprised of a, a series of evenly spaced, very narrow lines, where the spacing is set by the repetition rate of the pulses, which can be very, very precisely stabilized to the laser. And so, like I mentioned, this is basically an optical clockwork. It's something that allows us to take an optical frequency and down convert it to 10 megahertz, 100 megahertz, 10 gigahertz, and so on, signals that we can actually interface with existing electronics for useful things. Now, as a quick detour, if you look at this spectrum of the optical frequency comb, you know, a number of evenly spaced lines, it might be kind of suggestive of something. In fact, if you uh, tune your repetition rate appropriately through choice of the resonator geometry, then you can actually basically make the ITU grid. And so one really cool application in optical communications is that you could use a single optical frequency comb as a replacement for hundreds of individual lasers, simply by choice of a, an appropriate resonator geometry and uh, appropriate multiplexing and demultiplexing stages. And then I might be uh, way off base here because this is not my area of expertise, so feel free to you know, call me an idiot after this, but I tend to think that if we can stabilize each comb tooth at the kilohertz level by stabilizing it to an atomic line, and assuming we can make progress in the multiplexing and demultiplexing, which has already been demonstrated at about the gigahertz level, then we could potentially be looking at significantly denser optical communications with uh, channel spacings of gigahertz or less. You know, potentially, as far as the, the, uh, the comb and the clock technology supports, it could be as small as you know, 100 megahertz if the multiplexing permits. So this will enable dramatically higher throughput for uh, optical communications. And along those lines, uh, another recent effort in data centers has been moving towards optically switched networks so that we can avoid a redundant stage of optical to electrical to optical conversion at the switching layer. This has the potential to simplify the network topology, dramatically reduce the power consumption in the networks, and increase the data throughput. But there's a problem that optical switches deal with, which is the fact that uh, every time you open a channel between a receiver and a transmitter, you're basically establishing a new physical link with a little MEMS optical switch. And this requires, in general, a resynchronization of the clocks on the receivers and the transmitters to compensate for slow phase drift and jitter in the link. So there's a lot of work in this at uh, UCL and Microsoft, and they've shown that this is actually a dominant limit in the throughput of optical networks because uh, the, the amount of jitter in the clock actually determines the length of the preamble statement that you have to send before the information in order to align the clocks. And in fact, modern data center traffic is typically so short in length that the preambles can be a very sizable fraction of the overall message length and therefore the requirements for clock synchronization can actually dominate the overall network throughput. In a lot of these uh, implementations, they're generating 25.6 gigahertz or similar microwave frequencies to clock the optical transceivers by multiplying up from something like a 10 megahertz quartz oscillator. And you end up with quite a bit of phase noise in this, which directly limits the uh, optical throughput. And there's a really elegant solution from the optical world where you can actually down convert 
optical to microwave instead of up converting from RF and end up with a dramatically lower clock jitter. So in this demonstration from NIST that you can see on the, the bottom right, they actually demonstrated an integrated timing jitter of less than one femtosecond from one hertz to a megahertz. And you can compare this with uh, around 100 femtosecond jitter for state-of-the-art quartz oscillators. So this has the potential to very, very dramatically reduce switching times by speeding up clock and data recovery processes and therefore enhance optical throughput. And in kind of a more classical note, you know, it's something that we, we are very familiar with with the world of timekeeping and time dissemination. You know, we've heard a lot about NTP, PTP, white rabbit, schemes like this. And of course, there are optical analogs that can allow synchronization at even more precise levels. So a really common technique is called two-way optical time and frequency transfer, which actually leverages the combs that are already built into optical clocks in order to uh, make time dissemination measurements where that can actually enable femtosecond level clock synchronization at remote sites. So this has been demonstrated uh, through hundreds of miles of turbulent air by the Newbury Group at NIST. This has been demonstrated to aerial platforms, and this has even been demonstrated in uh, free space links with 100 dB of optical loss, which is compatible with a ground to space link. So it's actually not too far out to say that the data centers 10 years from now could actually be synchronized at picosecond level mediated by uh, ground to space optical communications. And then we just heard a lot about assured PNT, which is a, a very, very important topic. And um, there's a, a, another kind of cool optical technique that can be applied here where time entangled photon pairs can actually serve as the medium for transmission of dissemination information. And the really cool ingredient here is that you can also encode quantum information in the polarization entanglement of these photons. And therefore you can basically achieve what's called a quantum secure time synchronization protocol where you can make a local measurement that is able to discern whether your timing information has been tampered with by an adversary in a manner that's very similar to quantum key distribution. So I'm here demonstrating some hardware over at the Experience Center. We have a, a very simple optical clock architecture that we've pioneered at Inflection. We're looking to begin production and shipping out pilot units in uh, 2024 and have a full product release near the end of 2024. So what we're targeting with this is not exactly state of the art for these very large scale devices with 18 digits of performance. What we're actually aiming for is something that is a little bit better in performance than a passive hydrogen maser, so about 10 to the minus 13 at a second or a bit better but with a roadmap towards dramatically reducing the size, weight, power, and cost to the point where we could have sub-liter devices that are in a form factor compatible with the OCP time card at price points of less than $10,000. So what we really want to hear from you, my call to action, is we want to hear what kind of new, really exciting applications this enables in data centers, whether it's optical communications, database synchronization or something that I haven't actually anticipated here. You know, we want to kind of know all of that. We want information on what size, weight, power, and cost is tractable for your application. We want to know about interfacing, really all of it. So I'd, I'd love to chat to anyone in kind of an application-specific role about what we can do to enable new things in your data centers. And uh, like I said, we've got a clock over in the Experience Center. Please ignore this booth number. It's no longer correct but we're over by the, the uh, guide tech and, and side time guys. So please come find us. I'd love to chat with you. Thank you very much. All right, so questions, any? We have about a minute for questions. I thought this will have like some nice physics questions. Like this is the physicist you wanna ask. <laughs> wait, 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 there's, and then, then you can ask. It. Kishan, next you can ask. Yeah. So hello, can you hear me? Okay, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but this is not a physics question. Okay. <laughs> uh, we're extremely interested in this idea of, you know, can you speed things up with databases? And uh, what we have discovered over three decades of dealing with databases is that data gets corrupted. And we think there's a fundamental reason why that perhaps uh, is caused by a misunderstanding about the nature of time. So there is a lot of work being done recently, and a lot of it, I'm surprised to see the really excellent presentations this morning lined up the way they were, because 
they really do illuminate the problems that we have seen. So it's not just, can we get accuracy? We know we can get accuracy. The problem is for how long. We don't care if you know, something's going to you know, be accurate to the age of the universe. We care if it's going to be accurate for one hour to the next. And even with high-speed trading, uh, you end up having to go to all sorts of great lengths to try to pretend that there is a simultaneity plane at which the timestamps are equal and fair to all of the participants in those data centers in Chicago or in New York. So my question to you, I'm sorry for the long preamble, um, is how confident are you that you can establish the ordering of events through timestamps as an ordering mechanism to uh, govern the algorithms uh, that are modifying this data? Yeah, I mean, it comes down to our measured performance. You've alluded a few times to maybe the illusion of simultaneity that can come from relativistic effects. And certainly this is, a, this is an effect. It's, it's a fairly small effect, you know, unless you're dealing with clocks that are moving at very high relative velocities or sitting in extreme gravitational fields. Um, but, you know, I talked a little bit about clocks at the 10 to the minus 18 level, these very large research devices right now. And there, these relativistic effects are actually something that they care about very deeply and, and that they're, you know, actively having to characterize in order to guarantee their clock performance. At the level of performance that we're targeting for data center level applications, I don't really think that it's going to be a large issue, but it, with the rapid pace of technology, it could be within a few years. Okay, we'll talk after, thank you. Kishan. Thank you, beautiful presentation. I had a question regarding uh, the frequency comb. As you can see, a comb is a foreign thing to me, but uh, 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 the frequency comb, you're modulating the laser right, with, with some pulse rate. Uh, does that impact its performance as an atomic clock? You know, it's exciting the, I guess, the rubidium vapor or whatever other vapor that you use. Is there an interaction there? So it's, it's a little bit separated. The, um, the laser that's actually being modulated is the clock laser, not the frequency comb itself. It's basically our local oscillator that's that is indeed interacting with the rubidium vapor by scanning across the atomic transition to extract an error signal. The frequency comb itself is a separate device that's pulsed and is referenced to the clock laser purely optically. So the, the comb itself doesn't really directly interact with the atoms. But there are some very cool schemes with this technology where people are experimenting with direct excitation of the clock transition using frequency combs, which is a really, really cool technique. Right, I think uh, we can conclude this uh, session and uh, I think we will reconvene uh, at 12.30.